ดิมะลังดิอามะเคตซอยมอมอไคซิอานะเมเกเลริตเตดเฟลลิชิปวอลคัมบายอันสกักวอลคัมทูเชิร์ชไอกรีตยูออลอินเดลิฟวิ่ง
I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood, and I will not speak their names with my lips. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who counsels me. Even at night when my thoughts trouble me, I will always let the Lord guide me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Family, I, I'm really going to ask you to indulge me. Let's, let's read it again. Okay, we're going to take it a little bit slower this time as well. Verse 1. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood, and I will not speak their name with my lips. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who counsels me, even at night when my thoughts trouble me. I always let the Lord guide me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal prayers. Let's, let's keep standing as we pray together. Lord, indeed, you are our safe place. We pray to you now, O oh good creator God. We say that you are sovereign and you are in control of everything, including every detailed aspect of our lives. Father God, you are good, and anything good that comes to us, God, is only from your hand. Oh Lord, how sweet it is to gather this morning as your people here in your name, all because of you. Lord, as we've read your, from your word this morning, we are reminded that life apart from you brings death and ever-increasing destruction. And yet you have saved us into life everlasting. And so, Lord, we bless your name. Bless you, Jesus. Thank you that you see our hearts. Right now, you see our hearts. You see our anxieties. You hear our prayers. You guide our steps. And because of that, Lord God, we can be confident, glad. We can even rejoice in you because you have secured for us an eternal and abundant life. You did that, Lord God, when you sent us your son, Jesus. And so we bless your name. We lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, now and use this powerful song found in Psalm 16 to change the lives of all those hearing this message. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. And I invite you to take a seat, family. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, Siakul said that she uh, revealed her age. I'm going to reveal mine now a little bit. Um, any rem anybody remember like CD sleeves? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic. Any anybody like fans of music and, and, and you, you were such a fan that you wanted to hear like how the song was written and why it was written. So you like got documentaries and you even bought DVDs. It's like how they made that album. That was me. So I was a big rock, rock music fanatic. Uh, and I loved to buy a new album of a band that I, that I loved, and then I'd buy it, and then what I'd do is I'd, I'd listen from track one to track 14. We actually listened to entire tracks back in those days, right? <laughs> and we didn't just listen to the first verse and chorus. It was amazing. Um, and we listened from track one to track 12. There were like 12 tracks on an album also in those days, not four. So, uh, <laughs> so, so that's what we used to do. And what we'd you'd do is we'd put out that CD sleeve, and then we'd, like, we'd read, and we'd read the track with the lyrics, and man, it was awesome. 
Now, we're going to do something of that with our song today. Okay, so we, we need to understand how it is that this album was put together, what, what, what is going on in this specific track. So we're going to dive deeply into the context of this, of this book of Psalms and then this book, uh, this, this psalm specifically, Psalm 16. Okay, now you may know this, but this is, so this is a bit of a refresher and reminder. So the book of Psalms is a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers. They were from the various periods of the nation of Israel's history. 73 of these psalms were linked to the poet King David, as is the case with our Psalm 16 today. But there were a number of different authors, namely Solomon, Moses, Heman, Ethan, Asaph, and the sons of Korah. And the rest of them were anonymous. Now, whilst most of these psalms were used by the choirs that sang in Israel's temple, or they were used as uh, prayers to be prayed as liturgies by families at home, the book of Psalms is not merely a hymn book or a prayer book. After the nation of Israel's exile to Babylon, these psalms were, were put together and intentionally arranged into the book of Psalms that we have before us today. Listen to this. It says, it's been said that the book of Psalms is a virtual temple whereby one enters the Psalms to meet with God and to listen to the story of God's kingdom, sung back to them in poetry. How beautiful. Stop, rewind, go back and repeat. The book of Psalms is a virtual temple whereby one enters the Psalms to meet with God and to listen to the story of God's kingdom sung back to us in poetry. I'm going to pull up that graphic of the kind of breakdown of Psalms. This is how it's broken up. Uh, there's a conclusion consisting of Psalms 146 to 150. There's an introduction made up of Psalms 1 and 2. And then it has an internal organization of five main parts. Very uh, uniquely titled Book 1, Book 2, Book 3, Book 4, Book 5. Okay, but I want you to know this. This is significant because the Torah was also organized into five main parts. You will recall Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so the book of Psalms is structured for God's people as a parallel supplementary type of Torah that will teach God's people the practice of prayer as they seek to obey God's word given in the first Torah. Book 1 takes, takes us up to Psalm 41, with the bulk of Psalms, the Psalms found in Book 1 being authored by David. And incidentally, Book 1 is where the majority of our sermons for this first section of the mixtape playlist series are coming from. So we're going to spend most of our time in book one. And so it's safe to say that our author David's story is really important in book one of Psalms. We know this, many of us know this. David experienced many times of hardship, but through it all, he trusts God with radical faith. Radical faith. And in Psalm 16 today, we have David writing to us about what that faithfulness practically looks like. What does it look like to be practically faithful to God? Now, family, as I said earlier, these words were penned to be delighted in and recited aloud. And so as we dive deeper into the psalm, I want to say that at the outset, if you feel moved to join me in the reading of these words, of these 11 verses, as I go along, I encourage you to do so. Okay, so as we go through them, please feel free to be encouraged to read them out aloud. Then, before we do a deep dive, any feelers in the room? Any people that feel like governed by their emotions? I am one, so it's okay. Okay, it's allowed. God created us. You, you even made us. It's a safe space. Is it just me? I saw, I'm seeing a little bit of... Okay, cool. Okay, great. David was certainly a feeler. He was a poet. And so perhaps what I'm about to say will resonate with the feelers in the room. Although I think it's going to resonate with everybody, even the analytical folks as well. It's important to note that here in Psalm 16, David is writing to remind himself of the goodness of God, of the fullness and of the joy that he finds in God alone. We often think, oh, he's writing it because he's inspired by that feeling. But I think it's a, a reverse. I think he's, he's writing it to remind himself of God's goodness. The psalm's titled Michtam, Michtam which in Hebrew seems to mean deliverance, saving from or covering from. And what's interesting, though, is that this psalm was most likely written, get this, at a time of peace in David's life. He wasn't at war. He was not being chased by Absalom or Saul like he was in other psalms. 
And yet, he is still seeking the Lord's deliverance from circumstances and temptations. And in his head, he must have known these things. He knew the, the goodness of God. He knew the fullness and the joy that he finds in God alone. But he intentionally pens them down again so that he can meditate on them and so that he can lead his heart to believe them. So that he can lead his heart to believe them. So that he can lead his heart to believe them. The track's not stuck. I'm trying to make a point. You see, often us feelers believe that we need to feel things or to say, to say them and do them. But actually, David knew that it's the other way around. To quote a famous worship leader saying, we write songs and we sing music and we recite lines of songs and we repeat them and we play them over and over again, not because we always feel these truths, but we repeatedly sing God's truths until our hearts believe them. That is who you are, Waymaker. How's it go, Waymaker? Miracle worker, promise keeper. Loud and, that's what we sang this morning. That is who you are. We need to sing it over and over and over again. And so if you came here this morning and as we read Psalm 16 out loud, intellectually you knew those words to be true. But on the inside of your heart, you were questioning those very same words. Well then, brothers and sisters, you're in good company. You're in good company because that's how it was for the very author of the psalm. You say, Jono, how do you know that? Well, friend, I'm glad you asked. Text tells us. Let's dive deep into Psalm 16, verse 1. Again, as I read, you're welcome to read along with me. Verse 1 says, Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. Here our psalm opens with the, the words of deep trust in God, who alone, God alone is David's shelter from life storms. What storm is he facing here? What storm? What particular issue is David crying out to God for protection and to seek solace from? Well, fast forward just a little to the first part of verse 4 of our track, and we'll see what David is seeking protection, refuge, and rescue from. Verse 4, A, the first part says, The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. It's interesting that, as I mentioned earlier, here is a time in David's life where he's not on the run, he's not at war, and yet he still seeks deliverance. But here it's deliverance from himself, his own flesh, the things of this world. And that's often the case in idle times, isn't it? It's often not when we are going through the most that we struggle with temptations. That's when we're in our devotions, listening to those amazing songs, that's when our obedience and devotion is on next level. But it's often just after a tough time where we really start to struggle with temptations. Times of peace. Here we have David seeking protection from putting anything before God, enjoying anything above God, and longing for anything more than God. Success, image, education, wealth, pleasure, fertility, family, power, influence. Many of these things, family, these are good things, but David knows that to live for and to love anything more than God himself leads to ruin. Yeah. Ruin. Yeah. And so his desire is to be faithful, unwavering and steadfast in his devotion, his faithfulness and his obedience to God. Much like the man from Psalm 1, remember that track? Who delights in the word of the Lord, meditating on it daily. David recognizes that putting anything in our lives in the place of God leads to the multiplication of sorrows. Sure, may feel good for a while, may even feel good for an entire earthly life, 60, 70, 80 years. But eventually, the ways of this broken, fallen world lead to destruction and death. An eternal separation, eternal separation from our loving Creator God. So he cries out, Lord, protect me. Protect me. David cries out, save me that I may not turn away from you, God, and toward the things of this world. But then, what's really neat is that David then tells us how he seeks refuge in God in order to be protected from these deviances, these earthly pleasures, and these earthly rewards. We see how David takes refuge in God in the following verse, verse 2. Verse 2 says, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have nothing good besides you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. 
I have nothing good besides you. David takes refuge in God, firstly, by praying and communing with Yahweh, his creator God. I said to the Lord, he's praying. Someone in here needs to hear that. You want to take refuge in God and seek his protection from being drawn to the things of this world? Prioritize prayer. Amen. But get this, don't just prioritize praying your wish list to God. Yeah. Do what David does. He prays prayers that declare to God who God is yeah, and specifically who God is to him. Yeah. Lord, yeah. you are Yahweh, yeah. the all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present creator God. Lord, you are my Adonai, my Lord and my master who reigns sovereign and in control and you are my good. Everything that I have that is good is because of you, yeah. O oh Lord. Amen. Amen. David prays prayers and delights in who God is and who God is to him. Not only that, verse three, as for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. Not only is God David's refuge that David prays to and exalts, but God's people are David's delight as well. Another translation in the NRV says, as for the saints who are in the land. In other words, it's another way of saying, as for the believers who are here in the land. As for the believers here. They are my delight. Here, David is expressing the importance of the community of believers. They are his delight. And not only that, undoubtedly, they probably spur him on to delight in God even more. Yeah. I love football. I love talking football. But I lo there's nobody that I love talk talking more about football with than Chelsea fans. Hey. Where were you... In 2012, in that semi-final, when we parked the bus and we blocked Barcelona from doing anything. <laughs> Where were you when we watched us win the Champions League in Munich in 2012 that night, that glorious night in their own backyard? Where were you in those COVID years in Lisbon when we won the second Champions League, a London team to win two Champions Leagues? Remember those times? Man. I love talking about soccer, but I love talking about soccer with Chelsea fans. David delights in God by delighting in God's people. Let's bring it home. Man, I delighted in worship this morning. This band here tonight, this morning, tonight. This band here this morning, it's usually a band of four or five, but there were three. There were three. Man, it's a glorious story. There were three. We got one person playing an instrument that they don't usually play. They're professionally trained in another instrument, but they're playing another instrument. And they got another person playing an instrument that they don't usually play, usually killer on electric, but today it's on acoustic. Now I've never led, seen you led uh, beautifully lead worship as beautifully as you did this morning. I'm delighting not in them, I'm delighting in what God has done through his people, amen? God took each person individually and put it together and made something more glorious. God's people are our delight. David's delight is in his fellow believers. Contrast this with the community of the wicked and the mockers that Pastor One took us through four weeks ago from Psalm 1. You want to take refuge in God and seek his protection from being drawn to the things of this world? Participate in his church. Value community. Prioritize and take delight in God's people. Amen? Yeah. I saw a video this week on, on, on social media whereby a person gets into the car and they say, man, church is foolish. I'm done. Don't tell me to greet my neighbor. Don't tell me to do any of that. It's, it's foolishness. And whilst I get what that person is saying, I'm introverted too, question of the day sometimes makes me uncomfortable. Family, you need to hear this. Church is not about you and your preferences. Church is about the community of believers. It's not about you and just meeting with God on the screen and then driving out early. No, no, no. It's about the community of believers, delighting in the community of believers. Church is not about you and your preferences. Carrying on, second part of verse four. David says, I will not pour out other gods' drink offerings of blood, and I will not speak their names on my lips. I will not pour out other gods' drink offerings of blood. I will not speak their name on my lips. Do you want to take refuge from God and seek his protection from being drawn to the things of this world? Don't participate in the practices of this world. David says, he dare not even utter their names. 
In, time, in David's time, pouring out drink offerings of blood was a practice of pagan worship that theologians believed to have involved human sacrifices. So now you may be thinking, man, well, I've never murdered anyone, taken part in a human sacrifice, so I'm all good. Well, yes, but no as well, okay? What David is saying here is that he will not even participate in any practice that causes him to doubt God's goodness in his life. He's not going to participate in any practice that causes him to doubt God's goodness in his life. How's all the comparing on social media working out for you? Is pornography causing you to doubt that what God has in store for you is not good? How do you feel after spending 15 minutes on Instagram? Do you need to have a backup plan and take control of every situation in life just in case God forgets you and doesn't come through? David says, don't even speak these practices' names. Don't even say, oh man, I wish I had that. Man, I bet her life is easier. If only I could be like him and have their job and have their spouse and have their money, their qualification, their whatever. David says, don't even speak it. Don't even speak it. Instead, instead speak this. Verse 5. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. Here, David, similarly to verse 2, once again, he declares who God is. Scholars say that when David speaks of God as his portion, he is saying that God is his real, true wealth that will never, ever fade away. A portion referred to a family's wealth, but not just their portion of land. So it wasn't just a physical piece of land, it was their wealth. Included all their earthly wealth. And David says that God is his real, true wealth, which will never fade away like earthly wealth does. And when when David speaks of God as his cup, He's saying that God is his real, true pleasure and delight. God is his plan, his future, and his ultimate good. Contrast this to Jesus, right? Jesus in the gospel, he's praying to God and he says, take this cup of dying on the cross away from me. The cross was Jesus' calling here on earth, and yet it was also his greatest glory. David is declaring that God is his calling. God is his future, his plan, his delight. God is his greatest glory. David is, in essence, contrasting God to the fleeting, destructive idols and things of this world. Family, you want to take refuge in God and seek his protection from being drawn to the things of this world? Pray prayers to God that contrast God to the things of this world. Again, don't come with your wish list. Pray to God and declare to him that he is awesome. He is wonderful. He is majestic. He is holy. He is completely set apart from the things of this world. He is eternal. He is glorious. He is great. He is merciful. He is graciously and unconditionally loving. He is sovereign. And he is in control. And he holds your future in the palm of his hand. No matter what your present situation tells you. Your future is absolutely wonderful. It's an eternity with your maker. Eternity with your maker. But David's not done. He's not done. Continue on. Similar vein, verse 6. David continues. He says, The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Inheritance. Here, David is now speaking of land and inheritance. In fact, he uses language reminiscent of the nation of Israel's conquest of Canaan and Joshua's subsequent division of the promised land of Canaan. You can read about it in Joshua 21, 43 to 45. David does this because Much like this land, the promised land to Israel, was the fulfillment of God's promise to them, so God's place for us in eternity will be a fulfillment of his promise to his people. 
And so brothers and sisters, you wanna take refuge in God and seek his protection from being drawn to the things of this world? Draw your focus to the incredible and permanent inheritance that God has in store for you. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. If you're secure in Jesus, then you have a promised place and an inheritance that will not decay in heaven. Amen? It's just for you. Now, verses 1 and 6 were kind of like stanza 1 of our track for today of Psalm 16. Okay? We, come, we come to our second stanza or the section of, of verses from the song. And guess what? Surprise, surprise, David continues to praise God to seek refuge and protection in him, even in life's difficult moments. Verses seven and eight, he says, I will bless the Lord who counsels me. Even at night when my thoughts trouble me, I always let the Lord guide me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Again, I will bless the Lord who counsels me. Even at night when my thoughts trouble me, I always let the Lord guide me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. The kind of praise seen in these two verses protects God's followers from being drawn anxiously to the things of this world, to the worries of this world. What exactly is going on here? Well, during the day, when David is awake, he's counseled by the Lord in reading his word, by meditating on it, by memorizing it, which leads him to live out an obedient life during the day. And then at night, because of all he did during the day, he's able to rely on God's counsel to guide and lead him when those troubling, anxious thoughts come to him at 3 a.m. Did you do that? Are you worried about how's that going to work out? What are you going to do? I know that God is good. He's got me. And so he says, God is always present. It's as if God is always present because as he reads his word, he's guided by him. And at night when those anxious thoughts come, he rebukes them with the word of the Lord. And so God is always with him. He's at his right hand. David says, he's at my right hand. Now we've seen this before a number of times in a number of sermons, but to refresh our memories, to be at someone's right hand means to be a number of things. It could be their advocate in court, their support in battle, their companion for a journey. God is always with him. God is always with him. God is always pursuing him, running after him, surrounding him, fighting for him. Family and friends, you want to take refuge in God and seek his protection from being drawn to the troubling, anxious things and thoughts of this world? We saw this in week one. Read his word. Read his word. Meditate on it. Memorize it. This will lead us to feel God with us surrounding us in the good and in the bad, the day and the night. And so once again, David is led to praise God. And then starts to wrap up the song, verses 9 and 10. He says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely, for you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. Again, let's read those together. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. David is secure. He's glad. He's rejoicing. We can see why. Because in God, David has as we do too, by the way, he is a sovereign Lord into whom he can take refuge. Saw this in verses one and two. We saw it in verses two, five, six, and seven, this good news, and eight. We see that David also speaks of how good God is and how good he has been to him. And so he says, therefore my heart is glad. My heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My body rests securely. And so that's why he's glad and rejoicing. But there's also something new that he introduces here. He introduces something new, some new reasons for his confidence in the Lord. You see, Sheol, he mentions Sheol. Sheol was the domain of the dead. Some translations say Hades. Sheol was the domain of the dead. But David not only expresses his faith that death will not separate him from God, 
not only says death won't separate us, but he prophetically declares that a faithful one is coming who will be resurrected from the dead without decay. Jesus. Amen? Jesus. David knows that he may go into the grave, but God. Oh, but the good Lord will not permit his beloved child to suffer eternal separation from himself. Even in death, relationship with God endures because of the coming faithful one, because of Jesus, who will be resurrected from the dead without decay. But now, how do we know that verse 10 is not David speaking about his own death, but in fact the prophecy about a Savior who is to come? How do we know that? Is it a leap? Well, as Pastor One often says here at Rooted, let's let Scripture interpret Scripture. Let's let Scripture interpret Scripture. The apostle and disciple Peter in Acts 2, the most famous sermon ever preached. Uh, maybe you, you could actually say the Sermon on the Mount. So maybe the second most. Uh, who on the day of Pentecost is preaching about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus when 3,000 people come to faith. He quotes, get this, Psalm 16 verse 10. And he goes on to explain. You can bring up verses 25 to, to, to 31, but I'm just going to read from, uh, from 29. He quotes verse 10. Of Psalm 16, and then he says this, Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David, though David who you love. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In fact, they reckon it's pretty close to him. He's probably pointing out to where David's tomb is. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned to Sheol. The Messiah, Jesus, was not abandoned to Sheol. And his flesh did not experience decay. Family, Peter argues here that since David died and did not rise from the grave, the psalm draws special significance in view of Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus was a descendant of David. He arose from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And the resurrection of Jesus gives ground for the confidence of all believers since they too will not suffer decay and the Father will crown his children with life. The word decay, remember this? The word decay that we see here in verse 10 of Psalm 16 is the same word Pastor Wade preached on, on last week for the corrupt or spoiled from Psalm 14. And just like we saw last week that everything after the fall in Genesis 3 was in ruins. And in fact, only God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, only God is beyond the brokenness of this world, the decay and the corruption. That's why God the Father had to send God the, God the Son, Jesus, into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to save us and to restore us. And Peter, in Acts 2, helps us to see that the earthly King David, his words were in fact about the only heavenly king who came and defeated sin and death, who could not be held by the dying grave, who rose and ascended into heaven, and who raises all of those who put their faith and trust in him to be with the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Family, today, David and then Peter have once again brought us to Jesus. Amen. Tim Keller writes this. He says, Most of all the Psalms read in light of the entire Bible bring us to Jesus. The Psalms would have been Jesus' songbook, and it's safe to assume that Jesus would have sung all of the Psalms, all 150 throughout his life. He knew them by heart, and in fact, it is the book of the Bible that Jesus quotes more than any other. But the Psalms were not simply songs sung by Jesus. They are also songs about him. The Psalms bring us to Jesus. Family, track four, Psalm 16 is once again about Jesus. And so brothers and sisters, what is our response? Well, if you want to take refuge in God, if you want to seek his protection from being drawn to the things of this world, to the temptations and the worries, put your faith and trust in Jesus. Worship him as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that yet, then this morning, I urge you to make the most of the response time. Come up here, pray with someone, choose to be in right standing with God because of what Jesus did and nothing that you can achieve for yourself. Because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross that obtained salvation for all of those who would believe in him. And if we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus, 
then we need to ask ourselves some questions as we come to our final verse for today, verse 11. David says, You, O God, reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Family, I'll ask us, is God our greatest guide on the path of life? Is his word the loudest voice and the strongest influence in your life? Can you honestly say that spending time with God, whether it's reading his word, gathering here on Sundays or at family group on Thursdays, or just gathering with other Christians, brings you overflowing and abundant joy? Do all of, earth, of this earthly life struggles pale in comparison to the wondrous eternal pleasures that are yours in Christ Jesus? Can you honestly say that in God and in God alone, you find your true fullness, provision, joy, goodness? When was the last time that you were unexpectedly happy? Was it when you reflected on who you are, whose you are in Christ, on what you have in Christ? When was the last time that you reflected on whose you are, what you have in Christ, who God is, what he's done for you? I'm going to call the band up as we conclude. Psalm 16, as with every verse in Scripture, invites us to respond. It demands a response. As we read the psalm, we are reminded to pray to God, to delight in who He is. We are reminded to delight in His people, to participate within the community of, his, of believers, the church. We're instructed to not even speak the things that cause us to doubt the goodness of God. Don't even utter them. It calls us to pray to God through declaring who he is and what he's done and how your future is secure in him. We're worrying about tomorrow. Are you aware of the eternity that you have? We're worrying about tomorrow, but are we aware of the eternity that we have secured in Jesus? I ask us again today, I ask myself, I ask you, is God our satisfaction? Is He our fullness, our joy? Are the things of God, worshipping Him, gathering with His people, delighting in His Word, are they our priority? Is Jesus your Lord and your delight, recognizing that everything good that comes to you is from His hand, the author and sustainer of all things? Are you ever mindful of being in the presence of the Lord as you meditate on His Word, meditate on His Word in the day and you recite those words at night? Are you living intentionally in light of your good future with God in eternity? Family, this is not our home. Are we living in light of, our, of where we're going? We're going home. We're on a journey and Christ is at our right hand. Christian life is, is a battle. I heard this, this past week. It's, it's two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, we can focus on all that is broken in this world and we can focus on all of our, our struggles and all the things that are real. They are real. Or we can draw our attention like David did and remind ourselves, no matter what we're feeling, to who God is. Jesus, God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, we have secured for us because of the finished work of Jesus. And so which side are you going to focus on? I'm going to invite you to stand and pray. And then we're going to respond. We're going to sing. We're going to sing to God about who He is and what He's done. Let's pray. Lord, oh Lord, we, we just come saying that so often we come to You with our wish lists of things that we want much more than wanting to spend time with you. We come confessing that so often our happiness in this life is, is rooted in things, fleeting things, music, food, shows, our circumstances, even the weather, Lord. And then when suffering or hard times enter, we see that these things are actually fleeting, they're inconsistent, and so, Lord God, without you, without your constant favor, without your constant presence in our lives, nothing is actually a good thing. 
Apart from you, Lord God, nothing is good. And so, Lord God, Holy Spirit, come, we come to you now this morning. Refresh our hearts, refresh our minds. Remind us of the finished work of Jesus. And Lord God, may we receive once again what Jesus did for us with a fresh perspective, with thanks, giving glory to you. And may we rest in that hope that we have found in you, Jesus. Lord, we, we just come, to come declaring that you are our Lord. You are our good, our fullness, our satisfaction, our joy, our refuge. Lord God, we went to sleep last night and we woke up this morning all because of your grace, not because of anything we did. And so Lord, cause us to, to remember this fondly, to joyfully acknowledge that, Lord God, and to remember that whatever happens, whatever we are going through now, Lord God, there will be a day where we finally rise again, that we will not know, know death or destruction, that there will be, every tear will be wiped away we will rest in your goodness, your fullness, and joy forever. We love, we praise you, Lord God. Amen and amen. Family, I invite you to stay standing. We're going to sing the song. You may have guessed it. It's called The Goodness of God. Now, what's really interesting is that we often, we can sing this song. Man, sometimes we can sing this song when things are going well. But this song is not meant to be sung when everything's peachy and rosy. The song is meant to be sung when we're directing our thoughts to Jesus no matter what we're going through, to remind us that God is good. And so when we sing that God is good, when we sing that God is running after us, that's in spite of whatever you're facing. And it is true. You need to hear that. It is true. And so let's sing together.